how good it is to have words and to be able to sing those words together that lift our hearts and our thoughts above our circumstance, things that transcend this time. It's been a week to say, come Lord Jesus. It's uh, good to be together. This morning, I want to put in front of you, before we open our Bibles together, a pressing need. You know that our dear friends, the Cans, the Mitchells, and Amelia, are on the other side of the world, in Papua New Guinea, uh, seeking to make the gospel known and put the word of God in the language of the Doe people to see the church birthed there. And you've prayed for them, you've uh, FaceTimed with them, we've labored together as a church. Uh, you know that the Laymans served four years in a logistics role there in Madang, uh, the port city in Papua New Guinea. That is a critical role that has been a lifeline for our families up in the tribe. And the need I want to put in front of you is we have need of a replacement for Jeremy and Lori and their role there. Uh, you know that Jeremy is back. He's going to be starting the Expositor Seminary in the fall. And their four years of labor there really put in place uh, the mechanisms, the organizational structure, and the lifeline for our teams up in the tribe. Uh, a second team is in country currently and preparing to allocate to another tribe to continue that work. And remember, there are 50-some people groups with separate languages, with no gospel, no church, no Bible. And the logistics position is that facilitator servant role, a deacon role, really, which helps all of those teams uh, take the gospel to those tribes. We have a need to fill that role. I just want to make an appeal to you, if you're here this morning, to consider filling that role. Uh, if you're watching via live stream or if you're hearing this by recording, if you have an interest at all in fulfilling that role, I would invite you just to email me at smedley at gbcaz.org. Uh, right now, Craig Noyce, part of Team 2 in Papua New Guinea, is filling that role temporarily. And then the Tartaglia family is going to move to Papua New Guinea. Joey is our executive director for Finister Vision for the mission organization. He's actually going to move to fill that role so that Team 2 can move into the tribe, into another tribe. So it's not ideal, and yet it's such a critical role. Uh, we need to continue that. So uh, if you have any interest and you want to see the job description for such a role, um, again, just email me, and I'd love to let you know about that. Um, while we're talking about Papua New Guinea this morning, I didn't ask their permission, uh, but uh, Daniel and Sarah Bruce are with us this morning. Could I get you guys just to stand up? Thank you. Uh, Daniel and Sarah have moved to Arizona to train with Finisterre Vision to go to Papua New Guinea and serve another tribe, to be another team uh, as Bible translating church planters. So they attend and are pursuing membership at Grace Covenant Church here in the Valley, uh, a church that has expressed desire to support them. So we're glad to see your faces. We'll be seeing a lot more of them around as they continue to prepare, and we'll be praying for you guys. Thank you for being with us this morning. This logistics coordinator role is just critical because our friends are there. And, and in terms of needing supplies, needing stability in the country um, for uh, emergencies and contingencies, um, we really need friends uh, to serve them in this role. So again, if you have any interest um, or know somebody who might have interest, um, we're just continuing to seek the Lord's direction and pray for someone to serve in that way. All right, I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 13 this morning. In our short time together, again, we'll be leading into the Lord's table again this morning. Um, but this next section of Romans is a great place for us to be, a great place for us to be in thinking through how do we relate to one another in changing times as we learn to prefer one another in the midst of coronavirus. And really what we see in Romans 13, 8 through 10 is love under the reign of grace. You remember at the end of Romans 5, Paul introduced us to the idea that the Christian is no longer under the dominion or the tyranny or slavery of sin leading to death, 
but is under a new dominion, the dominion of grace. And this dominion of grace changes and transforms the Christian life. And really, all the commands that begin in Romans 12, 1 and following are an exposition of the reign of grace in flesh and blood. What does it look like to live the Christian life? And Romans 13, 8 to 10 continues that. We saw in the first seven verses of Romans 13 how a Christian is to relate while under the reign of grace to human governance. We see in verses 8 to 10 how Christians are to live under the reign of grace with the banner of love. And then in the fall, when we conclude Romans 13, we'll see the, how we are compelled to live urgently under this reign of grace. But this morning, we look in on love. So read with me, Romans 13, 8 to 10. We'll very briefly look at these three verses this morning. Paul writes, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not commit murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of law. Will you pray with me? God, we come to your, this, to your word this morning and we ask for your help. We want to understand, we want to see clearly what you have for us. God, we pray that these words would grip our hearts and that you, by your Holy Spirit, would conform us to the son of your love, the embodiment of love, the perfect demonstration of love. And we long to be more like him and we pray for your help in that in Jesus' name. Amen. The Christian life is to be a life of love. And this morning, we see three statements in our text that explain our obligation to love one another. And we're just going to jump right into the first statement. It's found in verse 8, and it is simply this. Love remains our outstanding obligation. For the Christian, love is, a, is an outstanding obligation that stands, it remains. We are always under this obligation. And notice how Paul says this. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. Now, this is a passage on love. This is not a passage on finances. Lest we get confused, Paul is not condemning borrowing. Paul is simply using the language of borrowing to say, pay your debts. He's not saying it's a sin ever to incur a debt, but to pay your debts. And that really becomes an illustration, not about borrowing, lending, and repayment of financial debts. The obligation here is do not withhold from anyone what is due. If you have a mortgage, pay it. If you have a college loan, pay it. Uh, fulfill your end of the contract you signed. But all of that is driving us to this point Paul is making, love is always due. Love is always due. The, the debt of love is ongoing. You see, you can pay off your mortgage. You can make that final payment on your college loan. You can reimburse that borrowed cup of sugar or return your neighbor's crescent wrench. You can pay your lawn care bill, but you never, ever, ever finish paying off the debt of love. That is Paul's message. Christians have an ongoing obligation to love one another. We will never get out from under it. There's really striking language to describe this. Love remains for the Christian, our outstanding obligation. Notice what Paul says in verse 8. It is, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. And this one another is a key phrase in the New Testament that indicates that what Paul is primarily addressing here is Christian's love for Christians. Now, he's going to appeal to Old Testament law that broadens this a little bit for us and helps us understand a general principle that Christians just love. We love those outside the church, too. But Paul's primary focus here in the context of body life in the church is that we love one another. That is the primary application of his command right here. Love remains our outstanding obligation. This unique season for us prevents, presents opportunities for us to love extravagantly. 
to die to self, to prefer one another, and to seek to do those things which actually love one another in the body of Christ. And what did Jesus say about that? The world will know that we are his, that we belong to him, that we follow him by the love we have for one another. A second statement in this passage is that love performs what God demands. Love performs what God demands. Notice what Paul says here in the second half of verse 8. He who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. That's the New American Standard. Literally, the text reads, he who loves the other has fulfilled the law. And I think it continues this idea of loving one another, loving each other in the context of the local church. But he says, he who loves the other has fulfilled the law. And then drop down to verse 10, the second half. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Bookends on some Old Testament quotations and some summary of Old Testament law by way of example is this statement, love fulfills it. And you shouldn't think of the word fulfillment here as something like prophecy and fulfillment, telling the future and then it coming to pass. Fulfillment here means to bring it to its fullness or perform it to the fullness of its expectation. That is what Paul means here by fulfillment, to perform it fully. And notice how verse 8 starts with the simple word for. This is an explanation. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For, here's the reason, he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. In other words, when you and I love the way God expects us to, when you and I love one another perfectly, we find that we have already performed what the law of God was after. We have already performed what the law of God was after when we love one another perfectly. And by law here, I think we should understand this generally as God's directives. Whether you are an Israelite under Mosaic law or whether you're a Christian under New Testament directives, love is not lawless. Love, in fact, performs what God demands. We are God's people. We are to follow his instruction. He is Lord. We are his slaves. We do what he says. But what's really interesting about this passage is that the law's aim, whenever God directed his people, he, he revealed himself and he regulated his people. Whenever he did that, the aim was always love. Love vertically, our love for God, and love horizontally, our love for one another. And when you look at the Ten Commandments, it is often described as two tables of those commandments. There is a, a vertical table and a horizontal table. That is, there are directives that are given toward our relationship to God. You shall have no other God before you, no idols, etc. And then there are directives that govern our relationships to each other. And all of that is subsumed under this banner called love. And love really is the root and the fuel of Christian obedience. Love is the root of our obedience. Look, if you're about following some rules belonging to a social organization, the Elks Club or a local church or whatever you pick, you want to follow the rules, uh, you're nothing but a legalist. That's what a legalist is. A legalist is one who likes to follow the rules or wants to follow the rules either to puff himself up or to earn or merit the approval of others. And in a religious context, a legalist is one who claims to follow rules to merit the approval of God, right? That's every human religion on the face of the earth. Biblical fidelity, following God, being a Christian, is not lawless, but it has a totally different perspective on God's law, on directives, on following God's obligations. It is rooted and grounded in love, and it is fueled by love, a love for God and a love for others. And you need to understand that love is not lawlessness. You cannot say, oh, I don't keep the rules, I just love. That's not Paul's point here. Love keeps the rules, just for a totally different reason than the legalist keeps the rules or claims to keep the rules. No legalist ever actually keeps the rules. 
But one who is grounded in love from God, reverberating in love for God, echoing out into love for others, actually has a wonderful desire to do what God says. Why? Because God's law directs what love looks like in flesh and blood. God's laws for us direct us in what love actually looks like in real life. How do I love God? And how do I love one another? This text is not telling us, ditch the rules and just love as if love is some sort of sentimentality or love is what you make of it or love is a live and let live kind of mindset. No, the reality is love does what God demands. And it does it in the right way. It doesn't do it in an empty shell of rule keeping. Right? If you find yourself, well, i got to keep the rules, and you trample over people in your so-called keeping of the rules, you've missed the entire point of God's directives. And this really helpful reminder for us is that love performs what God demands. This is all about pleasing God. We love each other when we follow God's directives. And we follow God's directives motivated by love for him and love for others. How is this true? How is it that love performs what the law was aiming at? Uh, that brings us to our third statement this morning that helps us here in verse 9. For, verse 9 begins, another explanation word, for this. And then he lists several of the Old Testament commands. Um, and then he adds, and if there's any other commandment, it's all summed up in this. Love your neighbor as yourself and love does no wrong to another. This is the explanation for how love performs God's demands and actually gets at the aim of the law. And it is simply this, love summarizes God's directives. Look what Paul says, for this, don't commit adultery, don't commit murder, don't steal, don't covet. And if there's any other command, all of that is summed up in, and he quotes Leviticus 19, love your neighbor as yourself, and then he adds this, love does no wrong. This is a, a remarkable way to summarize law. That is God's directives, God's good directives for his people. It takes us out of the realm of thinking that love is just wishy-washy sentimentality. It's just emotionalism or it's just, oh, I have tender affections towards this person. Aren't they so great? No, love actually does things. And love actually does not do other things. These prohibitions and these commands from God are tangible expressions of what it means to love him and love others. Love cannot be indifferent. For instance, when you see commands in the New Testament that we are to correct one another, admonish one another, encourage one another, you cannot say, oh, no, 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 love doesn't admonish. Actually, God says it does. <laughs> To, to, to watch someone make shipwreck of faith because you love them too much to insert yourself into their lives and never say anything about it is not love. That is not God's definition of love. And it is not real love. And so what a great thing that Paul does for us here where he just says, look, these rules are not rules for rules' sake. Don't commit murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal, don't covet. And anything else God ever directs his people to do or to not do, they don't exist for themselves. God's law has always been for the purposes of revealing himself and for regulating his people for their good. And this was true in Israel's day. This is true in our day. You and I are to love. And, and it takes on real tangible form. You can't say, oh, you know what? I just want to love people and then violate one of the commands here in this text. In fact, if you back up to Romans 12 and you just think through all the imperatives, all of the commands given to Christians in Romans 12 and 13 that we've been working through in the past several months, uh, all of those are tangible expressions of what it means for us to love one another. You can't say, oh, I'm just going to love people. Don't tell me what to do. 
Actually, God says, here's how you are to love one another. I'm going to tell you what to do. And we do those things because he loved us, we love him, and that overflows in our lives into the lives of others. And notice how Paul sums this up. Love your neighbor as yourself. He is not implying you need to learn to love yourself before you can learn to love others, right? That's how a lot of people preach this verse. That is not what this verse is saying. You need to love others like you already have the disease of self-love. You are so concerned about every aspect of your own life already naturally. Now, just have a little bit of that going to other people. Listen, a fraction of our self-love expressed in the lives of others would feel like world-transforming selflessness. We just don't understand how self-absorbed we are. Has anyone ever truly loved neighbor as self? Ooh, I'm hungry. I better eat. Ooh, I'm tired. I better lay down. Ooh, I got to go to work. Ooh, I, I, me. All the time. It's what we always do. It's the air we breathe. It's the life we live. Have you ever lived that on behalf of someone else? And look, I know there are seasons where we give and give and give to someone who is really dependent but a lifetime of it for all Christians, for all people everywhere? This is not a command to self-love. <laughs> this is a, a command to bring our love for others somewhere in the same universe as the disease of self-love we already practice. And then he says, love does no wrong to a neighbor. This is a great all-encompassing negative way to say Love each other. Are the things you do bringing harm to others, to, to the one and others in your life, especially in the body of Christ? Either things you do proactively or things you neglect to do. Right? I, I, I can do harm to a brother by just being full of myself and bringing offense. And I can bring harm to someone in the body of Christ by neglect and prayerlessness, and a lack of care. We just need to up our game here. <laughs> we need to love one another. I think the coronavirus uh, pandemic and all the social things going on alongside of it provide Christians a remarkable opportunity to proclaim an otherworldly love that the world can't touch. And so this is a great little section for us to put before us. Thankful for God's provision in that. The men are going to take some time now to leave us and prepare the Lord's table. Uh, we'll be celebrating Jesus' death once again together. As they do that, I want to remind you of the instructions for our single-serve, non-gluten-free packets. If you are going to be receiving the Lord's table today when the men come by, if you'll just hold your hands out, uh, they will drop those. They're wearing masks and gloves, really working hard to keep us from touching the same things, breathing the same air, et cetera. Um, so just a reminder, too, there are two lids. The top clear lid, if you pull it apart, will uh, expose the wafer. We'll take it together, so hold on to it. Um, and then the second lid opens um, to give access to the juice. This bread and this juice, they are symbols they're symbols of Jesus' body, crushed, as Isaiah 53 says, under the hand of his father. And Jesus was killed at the cross as a substitute for sin. Every Christian can truly say, Jesus died the death that I deserve. It was my sin that he bore on him on the cross, 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made Jesus, who did not know sin, to become sin on my behalf, that I might become the righteousness of God in him. It's an exchange. My sin for his perfection. I, the guilty, go free because he, the innocent, was crushed in my place. These symbols remind us of Jesus' death. We proclaim that together until he comes. The Lord's table is not for everybody. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've not surrendered to him, I would encourage you, don't take these. Um, these are for believers. But if you're not a believer, 
you need to know the invitation to believe in Jesus Christ is standing. As long as you are breathing, you have opportunity to surrender your life to him. Don't wait. Turn your life over to him and find new life, even today. I would encourage you in a moment of silence, believer, to reflect on your own heart, confess any known sin, uh, rejoice in the opportunity to uh, see our sin placed on Christ, the sin bearer. It's sobering and it brings a joy that can't be touched. And so take a few moments, examine your heart, and then we will join together and take these elements. The men can come forward and distribute those. night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, he gave thanks, and he said, this is my body. It is given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Let's eat this together. Likewise, Jesus took the cup, holding it up. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. The musicians are going to come up for our final song while I pray. Let's give thanks together. Lord Jesus, we could never thank you adequately for coming to earth, living a perfect life, dying in our place. And we don't grapple truly with the depths of our own sin. We don't understand the gravity of your holiness in its fullness in its infinite measure. We certainly can't feel or understand what it was like for the perfect God in the flesh to become a sin bearer. God, you hate sin. You never knew sin in any experiential or personal way. And to contemplate what it was like for you to be clothed in our ugliness, our filth, our dirty garments, our unrighteous deeds, our foul thoughts, our wayward motives. And then to bear up under the punishment of your Father for those very things. To take them away forever for all who would believe. It's incomprehensible. And this is your love we love you truly because you loved us first and it could be no other way. God, we thank you for eternal life given through the death of your son. And we pray, God, that we would be those who effectively love one another in the way that you desire. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.